I can totally relate and you know I did my PhD in, in Spanish so I had to switch to English but now I find myself in a totally opposite place I'm not able sometimes to communicate in Spanish that well my science but actually science is a way of thinking is how your thoughts are going and what you're doing so starting here some initiatives to try to bring science to students in high school middle school that are Spanish speakers as first language and they hate struggle with the English. And I don't know how it is going to be because I really find myself doubting on how to pronounce or know how to pronounce how to find the words in Spanish to make them believe that they can do science. I mean, they can think in Spanish and speak in science. And I don't know how I'm going to do it if I cannot even do it myself right now. <laughs> so that is a real challenge for me right now. I'm just like, I'm just like, Okay, so I think we can start. Um, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction for the people that uh, never joined BioRoom, and then I'm going to leave the floor to Bianca, our chair for today. So BioRoom was started in April as a seminar series with short talks and um, a lot of cool talks from people that uh, wanted to share our science. And that's how we met all of us. And then we created this community and we decided to do a second edition and with the second edition, we also, we not only spoke about science, but we also did a part on um, career development. And also this is the last part on science communication. So I'm very happy that we're doing this um, new things. And also we are having amazing um, invited speakers. So I would like to thank for this, um, my co-organizer, Elia, and he's also taking care of um, all the um, video editing and a lot of other behind <laughs> the scene organizing things. And I'm Carmen, by the way, sorry, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm a postdoc at UC Davis. And thank also to other people that are not here today. Uh, Rebecca helped us with the banners in the very beginning. And then um, Alessandra helped with the logo. She did the logo for Bio Room. And thanks to all the people that uh, helped with the second edition because you're amazing and you all of you that you did chairs for every um session and it's it's been great uh so i leave the floor to bianca and please go ahead and she'll um, present introduce our invited speaker too hello everyone and welcome i'm bianca as you all know we're going to talk today about how to organize a science outreach event um i will give a general overview about how one can think about this and how can we conceptualize organizing um, a science outreach event. I will talk a little bit about my own experience, what I have discovered in the past couple of years trying to do this and also all the questions I still have about the process. And I will be focusing on um, science outreach events aimed at young uh, people and adults. And in the second part, our invited speaker, Mariana Alves, We'll talk about two wonderful initiatives aimed at um, school age children and education. So I don't want to bore you with too much theory, but I came across this paper and I thought it was worth sharing um, the scientific approach to science outreach. And this is a nicely written paper advocating that we should practice science outreach with the same rigor that we use in our in the science that we actually want to share and for this she proposes an interesting model i i have to admit in the beginning i was a bit surprised by um, kind of this radical view but you will see that there is of course value in um the practical advice she gives that is evidence-based. So this can be used as um, a resource to improve um, the way we organize our science outreach event. So as you can see, you have the development phase, the implementation phase and um, evaluation phase, of course. And mm -hmm. the emphasis is on defining goals beforehand um, for the outreach event and be aware that it has to be um, collaborative business and also go to the actual data from the social scientists telling us about how people learn and how they incorporate information into their own beliefs and behaviors. And of course, what we all know that it should be tailored to a specific public, but this might be a bit more tricky than it sounds. And in the implementation phase that we should make sure that it's a dynamic activity, that it's engaging, 
and that we have ways of assessing or receiving feedback from our public during the event, not just at the end of it or after the event is over. And of course, in the evaluation, to ask for feedback, to reflect on, on how it went, and also to share results and discuss these uh, results and these experiences with other science communicators and other scientists, which is hopefully what we're doing today as well. Um, here is an example of kind of how this is traditionally done and how the traditional approach can be then adapted to this model. For example, if a scientist gives um, a lecture at the public library um, about climate change and it shows how the impact on exotic and endangered species. And of course, she answers, as it is customary, um, answers questions at the end of the presentation. And here, an important point is that this is happening in a library, and library goers are already probably well educated people who are predisposed to listening to this kind of message. Then, if we try to um, reinterpret this with the model that she proposes, the goal would be to encourage critical thinking about climate change and also to emphasize personal relevance, the personal relevance of the topic. And then the collaborators could be um, local recreation clubs or public institutions. And a specific public could be um, people who are enthusiastic about winter sports. And then this activity becomes a scientist presenting at a mountain resort. So hopefully a more relevant location where she shows enthusiasm for snow sports and describes how the local snowpack may change in 20, 50 years. And that appeals to the participants' desire to share the activity with future generations and invites dialogue and questions throughout the presentation rather than only at the end. And another trick to hopefully engage the public more during the talk would be to allow them to interpret data or to give their perspective or opinion during the talk, not only at the end. And of course, then the evaluation can be done with um, a survey, with multiple questions, open-ended questions, and perhaps a question that is meant to be food for thought. And then, of course, the reflection and the sharing of the results, perhaps even online with other people who are interested in um, science communication and science outreach. Right, so this was the theoretical part. Um, and then I'm gonna use also my experience with Pint of Science as a sort of case study and tell you a bit about what I learned from that. But how to, where to begin, the first point would be where and how to find the public that you want to address. And thinking about science outreach, in a more traditional classic way, we have the formal and informal science institutions that classically organize these events from um, zoos and museums, aquariums to, of course, um, labs that sometimes, as we know, offer tours or have um, science outreach events in which they invite people to, to see where, where the science actually happens. Then there's this middle ground of interface organizations and communities. So also entertainment and art is in this uh, category. And of course, then, especially in 2020, I guess most science communication and science outreach was done online. And then it reaches, it gets directly into people's homes. Another quite classical idea, I think, or event that is what we think about when we think about science outreach are our science festivals that again find their place in this kind of um, spectrum from formal and informal institutions that have their own science festivals, so exhibitions in museums and so on. Uh, then the festivals that are more in a neutral ground, so for example, soapbox science that is really on the street, or specific science festivals that um, that have their own environment, or Pint of Science, for example, that takes the science festival into a pub. And of course, again, the online, which are not classical science festivals, but go more or less in the same category, like I'm a scientist, get me out of here, and Skype a scientist. I'm sure you heard about them. Um, and as I said, my 
experiences primarily with point of science. And this is a global science festival, but the nice and unique thing about it is that it's a global initiative that benefits from the, um, the branding and the advertisement at this global level. But the aim is to connect people with their local scientists. So inviting the local scientists into the pub, a neutral territory um, where they can discuss science in an informal way. So this is a nonprofit organization that is now active in 29 countries, around 400 cities, and it has more than 1,000 events. And it's been growing quite fast in the last couple of years. So again, talking about the public, and this is, of course, also related to the location. But the question is, who is this general public or this broad audience that we keep talking about? That usually we, it's a good idea to check our misconceptions about our public or what um, preconceptions we have about them. We usually tend to describe them by what they are not. They are not scientists. They don't know what, they, what we know. Um, they may or may not be interested um, in science. They don't understand certain terms, but we don't always truly understand who they are. So this is quite an important point. And one problem that has been highlighted is that in a very traditional, simplistic way of organizing outreach events, the idea, the general idea is that there's a lack of information that a scientist comes and fixes. It's a one-way communication. Uh, we come and tell you how things are, and this should solve all problems. But we already know that this does not work as straightforward as we think it does. So then how, what are better alternative ways to approach this? For example, in my specific case, so I live in Heidelberg, and this is where I'm organizing uh, the Pint of Science event next year. And I realized over these past two or three years that um, Heidelberg is a very specific case and trying to organize a science outreach event here is not the same as doing it in a different German city because there's an overwhelming population of scientists here, quite a lot of English speaking people. Um, so just taking the recipe of how other cities in Germany are doing it and applying it here doesn't work in the same way. So this is just to keep in mind um, about the um, context and the situation. So here what happens usually is that uh, a lot of scientists attend um, these science outreach events. So then the question is, are we really achieving our goal? And basically we have two choices. One would be to refine our strategies and really find um, our public, so non-scientists. But on the other hand, um, one could think that there's a lot of value also in what I called cross-pollination, um, meaning that biologists should also have the chance to learn about physics and the other way around. That maybe if this is our, the environment we're working with, um, then maybe we should um, also specialize in science communication among different branches of science. And then, of course, that probably would be a different kind of event than one that is really addressed to non-scientists. This is just a, an example, but of course, a more general approach, going back to finding out who the public is, is meeting them halfway. So here, um, an idea that I really, really like is combining science with um, a lot of other things that people might be interested in, in the style of Mary Poppins, that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Not that I'm implying that science is a bitter medicine, because I... I know that we are all here science enthusiasts, but we um, should keep in mind that not everyone ha has had the chance to discover and to like science in their, during their education and their upbringing. So we could meet them halfway by combining science with the, really the possibilities are endless. Art in general, theater, theater has the advantage of being really uh, mobile. So you can take the theater, um, to the people. Of course, music, movies, and books are very easy in, in book clubs and um, film festivals. Uh, and of course, sports would be another option, and even something like cooking in workshops and so on. So here I don't have time, of course, to highlight all of the wonderful initiatives that I would like to share with you, but I would like to mention one called Microscope Me Up that is mainly online. You can find them on 
uh, Instagram and Twitter. And these are two uh, PhD students from Italy, Chiara Di Ponzio and Francesca Miricola, that are now, so they, one of them is studying engineering with a focus on the cosmetic industry. And the other one is studying cancer biology. And they decided that um, a really nice way of bringing science to people is by combining microscopy images with makeup inspired by these images. And they also give a short explanation about the scientific process. So it's basically like a, a daily dose of science that is very easy to digest. And we know that seeing is believing. So just seeing a mic um, microscopy image can have quite the impact and then combining it with a form of art that is makeup. And of course, this is important because it's not just about informing, it's also about breaking stereotypes. You know, when, um, for example, during my education, it was clear that it was not science and makeup, it was science or makeup. You could not possibly be interested in both. Um, so now that's one of the ideas that we're trying to change. And they went even further. They also have microscopy me, microscopy me up art with food, art, um, paintings that are somehow related to the microscopy images. So this is their, their next page. So I really encourage you to, to look them up on um, social media. Another great initiative, um, I think this was in 2009, I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but I thought it was really cool is combining music festivals with science communication. And near Lisbon, there's this music festival where they did speed dating with the scientist next to a Coldplay concert, basically, which is, of course, the combination of uh, a concert and science was already quite new, but also this speed dating system where you have one-to-one -one interaction with the scientist as opposed to in a group that can have a completely different impact. And each person could talk to at least three scientists and ask them questions. Um, and I think this was quite a successful approach. If you know about other music festivals that combined or introduced um, science communication, please do mention them. I think this is quite a cool initiative. Right, so I won't talk about the message and how, what should be communicated because I think that's a different, another topic in itself, but briefly about development and implementation. And here I'm going back to the, my case study with Pint of Science. So for those of you who don't know, this event is organized as one to three evenings in parallel all around the world. <laughs> and this is really a, a relevant point from the logistics point of view, it's always Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday evening. And why is this important? Because it's a nonprofit organization and we don't usually have money for rent. But when you propose this to a pub, um, these are usually dead evenings for them. So they're more than happy to support because you're bringing then uh, a crowd of people uh, that will, of course, consume in their pub. So this works quite well from the as a business model, so to speak. And then we have one theme or one topic per evening and usually two to three speakers. And the speakers can be really anyone who is a science enthusiast or a scientist, um, regardless if he's a professor or a PhD student. And then talking about engagement, it's really important to have, or we usually have incorporated different activities. We have table activities from you know, DNA extraction to making your own virus that then you can take home. Um, and there's also this idea that there should be something that people take home with them in addition to the take home message that would spark conversation afterwards or remind them or that you really make sure that they have access to resources to follow up on the topics that were discussed. And of course, one of the most important points is how do we truly measure impact? Of course, an easy way to do it is, and the fun way to do it is we usually have pub quizzes, but it's also very important to explicitly ask for feedback. As I was saying in the beginning, also during the event, not just at the end, which is usually done with surveys and having um, other reflection activities. And here I'm very curious um, what, you have suggestions for innovative ways of evaluating and um, reflecting upon it. And always keeping in mind to ask the people what they want and 
yeah, what they thought was particularly well done or badly done. And <laughs> an observation from this paper I was mentioning earlier was that people are usually very eager to give feedback, especially when it's framed in the way that um, the experts now really need their input to adapt their own <laughs> experiment or their own uh, design, experimental design. And always keeping in mind that what we are aiming for is that this is a two-way street and it's not just us presenting something, it's also what about what we can learn from this, what we find out from this, um, and being connected to this community of non-scientists. Here, this is slightly off topic, but I wanted to share with you one surprise that I had this year. Um, I organize, I'm organizing with a, a friend, another PhD st student, um, a feminism in science book club, where we discuss books and movies, but also TED talks and TV series about feminist issues, not only inside of science. And here we had also the same problem. Who is participating? Are we really just creating a bubble of people who think in the same way? And this is more polarizing than um, helping. Are we just preaching to the choir? Um, and how is this useful and how this can be avoided? But one thing that surprised me was what I call the spillover of this initiative, um, how we started to hear about what boyfriends or partners were commenting at home, although they were not joining us in our meetings, how one father bought the book that his daughter was reading for the book club, um, how more friends were interested in what we are reading and what we are watching and how they shared their opinions. So basically all the people around the people actually actively participating uh, in the book club that were somehow um, touched by the message or influenced by it or did something about this. So I think we can be yeah, hopeful and positive that all of these um, events and activities have also this impact that you cannot easily quantify or see sometimes, but it has an echo around the, the com or in the community, hopefully, this as um, a side note. So <clears throat> some points for discussion, and I would really like to hear from you um, about other uh, science outreach initiatives that are that you thought were really cool or original. And this general question, do we need to be more rigorous in the way we do science outreach and use the science that is available? Even as scientists, maybe we forget sometimes about this. Um, I'm also interested in, we're I think quite a diverse group here, how science communication is in different countries. Um, I'm originally from Romania and now I'm living in Germany. So I know that the situation is quite different in Germany compared to Romania. And of course, my view is quite a European view um, of science outreach events. So I would love to hear from people from um, other parts of the world and how this cultural context affects this and how we can be more inclusive in our science outreach and science engagement. And if you have any ideas or experience with innovative, way, innovative ways of getting feedback and being in contact with the public that we want to address. Thank you very much, Bianca. That was wonderful. Um, I think we all like the idea of the um, music festival with speed dating scientists that we had no idea that was um, a kind of, yeah, it was very interesting. I, yeah, I personally had no idea. Can, can you explain me how that works? Like how, how they combine the um, music with, with the science outreach? Yeah, I, I think we have quite a couple of Portuguese people here. So if any of them knows more about this, I would be happy to. That was just Mariana. a curiosity. No, no, no. Mariana, mind. did you know I about can... this? Yes, uh, so uh, every year they have a stand inside of the festival. The festival is quite big, so, you know, a stand like any other um, a brand could have, for example, or, or the city hall. And uh, they created um, these, these relationships. Now they are even um, awarding. So I think the scholarships are financed by, by the company of the music festival. And, and yes, so they have these, um, they always have these stands now there and different activities every year. <laughs> And now with COVID, because I mean, I would like to start activity an activity like that, but with COVID, the speed dating, I don't know if you know there, if there, how we could do this 
online because having like speed date and, and, and assign like the micro groups or something like that. I know you can do groups on Zoom. So I don't know if, if anyone knows if this has been tried in the COVID times or how to do it. Native Scientist is going to trial uh, three, four formats of uh, online, but for school children. And then hopefully next year they, they will know. I think what is important is that you always test your format to make sure that it has the impact uh, that, that you want and you try different things. I don't know if anyone else has tried. So it, it was a great presentation, Bianca. Thanks, thanks for the, this uh, wonderful presentation. But I want to touch on what you mentioned during the presentation. And I'm, I'm from Turkey and this is my first year in the US. And I believe that the public definition is all, totally depends on your area and also the science uh, activities also depends on your area. I mean, uh, I was first realized uh, the point of science activity during uh, from the TV tour when I uh, when I back in Turkey, and it was it was super cheerful and it was so fun and I, I want to be attend some of the extent, but in Turkey it's impossible because we don't have. Um, I mean, yeah, probably all uh, you all know the uh, situation in Turkey. Where I, I'm coming from, uh, some kind of strict religion part so you don't have any really pop culture so it's it's totally um it's it's really hard to uh, create some uh, kind of this activity in the pop and we don't have this kind of events but uh, what do you think about uh, i mean you are also from romania probably you are uh, not the same but you know the situation in turkey as well so what do you think about uh, the some these kind of activities how can we uh, create these kind of events in more uh, more countries like me i mean from turkey and the other countries so what do you think about yeah that that's a great point i my dream is also to bring point of science to romania at some point and i will have to think carefully how to do that but in general i think that's the point um of this that it's always a collaborative effort and that you really have to rely on uh, communities that already exist and on all of this interface organizations and you can't just um, think, oh, I'm super enthusiastic about science and I want to make other people enthusiastic about science and let's have our own event that is only about how much we love science and uh, kind of ignore all of these uh, pre-existing communities and organizations. So I think then the question is to find the best one, including starting from churches um, and ending with the pub, but you really have to find what is the right one for your community and your environment and do your best to collaborate with them, yeah, with patience and respect, uh, because otherwise it's um, not a very effective approach. Pint of Science comes from England, if I'm not wrong, and they have like this old deep pop culture that in other places it's not that popular and that common. In fact, that one was the thing that shocked me when I arrived to the States, that they meet for for drinking. We meet and because we're meeting, we drink. It's different. The purpose, let's say, for us is socialization. For them, the purpose is drinking. So I understand what you're saying. What you should try to do, in my opinion, and I, I might be wrong, is try to find where people in Turkey are socializing more often. So I don't know if you have like two rooms or if you have, maybe it's more on the streets, for instance, because as Mariana was saying, I mean, they have like this music festival that it's outdoors. So maybe it's like more outdoors activities, but don't try to import the idea of the pub in Turkey because that's not going to work. Also, things that are more associated with drinking alcohol in countries where they have majority of Muslim community, that's not going to work either. Imagine trying to bring this to Morocco or to this place, that's not going to work. But, but, but the idea is to bring it, in my opinion, it's to bring it to a, a space where people are socializing normally and you bring them the science in there, I think. But I agree on the fact that when you go to these events, because I'm a super fan and I know the organizers of the Pit of Science in Valencia, where I did my PhD and everything, you, almost everyone was a scientist there. So it's really difficult to really arrive to the to the community that you want to 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 arrive. And 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 maybe it's because in Valencia, as I'm saying, we were going to pubs to try to follow the initiative of Pinto of Science. But we it would be better if you go to a bar where we eat and we have the tapas and everything because it's more likely to find people that are not scientists that are going on purpose to that pub to listen to that thing. So I don't know, maybe yeah. we should evolve on the approach in some of the countries. <laughs> I think you made a great point, but I didn't think about it, but it's true. Yeah, maybe I, maybe I touch on the, the different 
point. Maybe that's not that's not the case to uh, to to create these kind of events in while drinking in pubs. But the the thing I think I want to say about it's the science is not so popular as well in Turkey. So that's another issue. <laughs> I think that's another critical issue. Uh, other than the drinking and other than the pop culture, this is another issue. So I yeah, this this is our problem. Maybe. And it probably means that that country needs it even more. So that I. You know, it can be a challenge, but it's also like more stimulating on some points because like in cities, like Carmen was mentioning, like Valencia, I'm, I'm thinking even in my city where I was living in Italy, Trieste is full of academics and scientists. And I was doing a lot of science outreach there, but that was easy because, I mean, there was a lot of science already. People were used to science and, and I felt like, yeah, it, it was needed, but not as needed like it would be in other countries. So when... We were having like guests of um, other people doing science communication in like more complicated areas. I don't know. We we had like a guy who was doing science communication in the Balkans, and and that was so inspiring because he was speaking about former war zones and how he was trying to educate the kids for science, and that was really like something that I was thinking. Well, uh, I would probably like like to do something like that because that can really create also an, an, like even a deeper impact on that. So yeah, that that would be nice if if all of you can go back to your countries and and do such of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that maybe more than the country sometimes is the city because for example mm-hmm. in the states, but in a very rural area, it's very yeah. different than doing it anywhere else. And and also. For instance, I have done this in Valencia and I have experienced that in Valencia that it's a one million and a half uh, people in the city. Imagine doing it in my mom's hometown that it's like 1,000 inhabitants and most of them are like old people. Okay, it's going to be very different, but it's probably more needed there because there's less people that can do that in, in there. So so that is a very good point and who really needs it and where we should arrive and we are not doing the job because it's easier for us to stay in our nice bubbles of academics that's a very good point but i have a question for bianca so if you want to bring pint of science to your to your place who who do you should contact because i'm thinking that would be great for for the city where i am right now in roanoke so how how do i bring it how do i import the brand let's say Right, so you have to talk to the to the head of what well, kind of science world um, and tell them that you would like to do that, and they're usually quite open. Um, but you need to do this one or two years before. So I can give you the name of the contact person. Yeah, it's quite straightforward. Uh, it's not a problem. So yeah, I can definitely give you the information. Yes, and regarding what you were saying, this is I think the problem that maybe we don't realize that we're also quite. Um, Sometimes we're not really going to people to collaborate for this exactly to to get to these um, areas or to this these places that need it more, but we don't have access to them directly. So then you really have to truly collaborate with these um, other experts and these other organizations and communities that are already there doing something else that you can somehow do it together. Because otherwise, it's the problem of of trying to reach all of these places where, yeah, where there are not that many scientists exactly because uh, this is the nature of the situation and, and you can't do it by yourself. This, this idea that you can't just go there and spread the information. You have to understand what, what is happening there and, and connect with, with the local organization. I was learn. thinking, Bianca, do you know if like this, a conference of science communication exists? where all these different initiatives can talk to each other and organize or share ideas, like some sort of things that, that we are doing here in little, but in big, like a virtual yeah. event where all the people talk about their kind of organizations and events. So in, in Heidelberg, we had some, um, let's say, conferences on, on science communication, more than science outreach, um, right? and probably for students. But I think Mariana knows more, maybe. Um, I think there's, uh, I don't think there's like a world science communication um, meeting that I know of, but you have, for example, in Europe, you have Excite, which is very dedicated to museums, for example, um, and it's kind of a specific, uh, I, can, I can look for the link to, um, to pass you on, and there's also the World uh, Federation of Journalists, Science Journalists, something like that, that happens every year, so maybe 
there's more the in between different science communication initiatives. In Portugal, we have the the Portuguese Science Communication Conference too. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know. I think they're quite small um, in a sense or quite country specific or either specific for PhD students or for students and maybe not bridging um, you know, experts that have been doing this for many, many years in, in more traditional settings with um, students, for example, maybe this would be quite an interesting exchange of perspectives. Let's, let's think about it. Let's organize it. No, I, I have to say one more thing. I think it's uh, in Spain, we also have things like that. And it's like a very super active thing. And I love it how the, all the outreaching world is. And there are some conferences that have one day specific, all focused on science outreach and science communication. That is pretty cool. But I think that one of the limitations is that no, it's many times you don't want to do the outreach events in, in English. So many people that are doing it, they're doing it in an own language. So I think it's more difficult to do an international thing. I think it's, it makes sense that it's like a more local thing because you really need to be specialized in the local environment you're having so you can talk about your yeah, experience I was, I was more more thinking about people talking about their experiences yeah, not yeah, yeah. doing the event um, yeah, yeah, yeah. like I, they're I'm, doing the actual outreach just saying yeah. well I'm doing that in Portuguese in my own country and I'm doing that in that way no no I understand that but what I'm saying is that in, in my experience and, mm -hmm. and I may be wrong there there is a normally there's like a very strong local community that helps each other and they organize their own events inside and it's not like that much of sharing how they do it that is what I'm trying to say and mm -hmm. and they know each other because as I'm saying they talk to the same people in the same language and I think the language here is a limitation factor that doesn't mean it doesn't make sense to have a very big event or another thing but maybe um you are not that fluent in English, maybe, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see, I see what you mean, yeah, that makes oh, sense. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you, Mariana. Well, okay. Uh, I would like maybe here that uh, to say that at Native Scientists, we are, uh, we see each other as a science outreach initiative, but the goal really is to promote science learning. So. Uh, we shifting towards the concept of promoting science education rather than being a science outreach initiative. And when you move towards promoting science education or increasing science literacy in society, then you start looking into international conferences in science education. And there you have um, ESERA and early uh, which are uh, European-wide conferences on um, science education. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah. Also, in April, we will be organizing an event where we actually plan to invite Pint of Science, um, but we haven't sent you, which will, it's an online uh, two-hour-long conference um, called Innovations in STEM education uh, in the face of the pandemic, uh, where we would like to have uh, lots of different um, science communication, education and outreach initiatives, sharing the best practices or the learnings that happened during the pandemic. Um, and so uh, this could be also a starting point to get together a lot of these like-minded initiatives, because I do feel there is a need for us to start you know, like uh, eight years ago or nine years ago, uh, uh, projects like ours that survived time and people did not exist, you know. There were only individual science outreach projects um, that lasted uh, for as long as the person was there. And um, usually uh, the reach was local or very specific, right? And, um, and now we start having this type of projects which um, are really structured and organized and they spread easily thanks of course to technology. Um, and I think it's kind of a, a new thing uh, in, in the field. That's great, thank you. That's really wonderful that finally we can yeah, have more united ways of discussing about this. I wanted to mention one thing that is really small and quite silly, but just showing how much we learned from, or how this year has changed our pers perspective on things. For example, something that's super, super simple, uh, that somehow it was never 
I don't know, if we just didn't realize it. Then the way we do uh, the, usually all of these events in part of science is that you encourage people to ask questions. And uh, you think that if you're very open and warm and encouraging, they will ask their questions and be, you know, enter this dialogue. And somehow for, you forget that they're still kind of intimidated by the whole process. And now they're in this room with scientists and maybe they're not sure if they understood the topic. Um, and somehow we never thought that just that this is not enough until now we had to move to the online environment. And there was all this skepticism about how people will not be engaged and probably they won't ask questions. And of course the surprise was that everyone was asking so many questions. All of a sudden there was more engagement than we expected. Of course, there's also the point that the public was slightly different than usually. So this is also um, part of the explanation, but then also thinking about it and talking to people we realized that something as simple as allowing them to write the questions on a piece of paper or use an app for them to ask the questions would increase engagement so much more just because of this very simple idea that you kind of knew about and it's very simple, but still we didn't really act accordingly. Yeah. So this is one of the, the small but probably significant changes that we want to make next year when we're going back hopefully to live events, is to allow people to, to ask questions or make comments in a more discreet, anonymous way. Yes, um, sometimes the, the way uh, you, the channel that you use for people to make the questions makes a bit different, it's true. Um, I actually have a question about Pint of Science. Um, do you, because one of the problems, well, not problems, but worries that we have is, of course, when we work with the real scientists to promote the science education or to do the science outreach, um, we are very dependable on the capacity of the scientists to actually communicate effectively. Does Pint of Science uh, has any means of quality control this or... How do you work with this? How do you select the scientists and do you train the scientists? Yeah, this is a great question. So Pint of Science is quite um, flexible in allowing, of course, each event to be organized locally. So everyone decides um, how they want to do this and how they want to select the speakers. And especially when you start it new in a city, Basically, you select, you first go for the, the speakers that you already know they are um, <laughs> about. So this is quite easy in the beginning, but then it becomes tricky. Um, but usually that's uh, for us internally, at least it was people we have seen um, speaking before. Mm -hmm. And that we, and again, this is also nice that um, it doesn't matter the title or um, yeah, if it's a PhD student or a PI, um, it can really be anyone as long as they're able or we're sure that they're able to deliver an engaging talk on a scientific topic. Mm -hmm. But now I think we're, we're trying more and more to yeah, offer some coaching. Um, it's not really quality control and it's not very specific instructions, but just to do um, some amount of coaching before, beforehand and mm -hmm. um, ideally also rehearsal. Yeah. Uh, where we can provide feedback, the, the team can provide feedback. And then, of course, we have people who have some experience with science communication, and they're also scientists themselves that can um, hopefully help and, and give some constructive feedback. Um, yeah. But yeah, actually, since I, I now have to think about uh, the speakers for next year, I was also thinking about materials that could be helpful in, um, to send to the speakers and how to initiate this dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. But usually we're, so this was the situation here in Heidelberg, for example, until now we really went for the speakers that we, that were the best speakers that we knew about locally. Um, and now we have to, we want to go more for the topics, the topics that we think are relevant. And then we have to find speakers that um, could do the job for that specific topic, which is already more difficult. Yeah. Yeah, because, if, for example, when I think about TEDx or te the TEDs, you know, like they became so, so popular because, of course, they were super rigorous in training and coaching the speakers uh, to do a good job. 
Um, and yeah, I don't know, at, at, at some point, I think, uh, you know, we will have to also be very rigorous about this. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, the balance between quantity and quality starts to go a little bit unbalanced. Um, but uh, as you were speaking, I was actually thinking that we could create like a, a program where, you know, we start um, coaching the scientists by talking to the children with native scientists. And then uh, when they like approve on certain criteria, they can go on to speak a kind of science. <laughs> if they if they survive the quality control of the children you mean yes <laughs> quite a harsh test yeah I, I have a question but how can you control like the quality of the people coming when you're starting an event of those types because for instance i know that for instance for the ted talks what happens is that these people have been talking in other events and when they are well known they invite them to the tech talks right but if you're starting somewhere and not, uh, as we were saying, you want to be in a place that uh, doing outreach is more significant because there's less science around and everything, how can you make sure that the people you're inviting are really going to um, tap the standard and the things that you want, right? That's my question. I don't know, someone in my lab was shouting. I don't know, I felt lost for a second, sorry. Well, at native uh, at native scientists, we do training. We we do we, we we train the scientists, and then we provide support. And then and another trick that we use is that every workshop brings together three, four, or five scientists. So, in the middle of the group, if one person is not so good, the the impact it's not going to be awful because the others compensate. Thank you very much. Without further ado, I would like to invite Mariana to go on with... Bianca, may I ask you a very short question? Just a very yeah. short one. Did you did you reach more, like um, with this online kind of science event this year, did you reach like the same amount of people as in previous years or did you reach like more or fewer? Do you know? Uh, in principle, we reached a bit more than normally, but also very different public, right? It was now not only German and local public, but it was actually international. Okay. So of course, with only online event, this is, um, it was now you reach an international public that you mostly select by social media and how you advertise the event. But yeah, it was a bit more than, than usually for sure and more varied. Thanks. So thank, you. thank you very much. And apologies to Mariana that we are running a bit behind. So Mariana is a PhD student also here in Heidelberg and she is a talented science communicator. She's interested in science philosophy and science outreach and she will talk about two wonderful initiatives aimed at children. So without further ado, Mariana, please. Thank you so much, Bianca. Um, and I would like to thank you uh, for this invitation. Uh, Bianca and I met actually uh, watching Joanna speak here in Heidelberg earlier, earlier this year at, um, at EMBL. Um, and uh, yeah, it's very nice to see all the initiatives that you do here uh, in Heidelberg for the community. And thank you also to um, Carmen and Elia at Bioroom. Yeah, today um, I'm going to tell you a bit about science communication uh, for a world with more opportunities for, for children, uh, specifically about Cartas Consciencia and um, native scientists. Um, as you, um, as you said, I'm a PhD student at EMBL. For the ones that are in other parts of the world, I just wanted to show how EMBL looks like here in a beautiful Heidelberg. And um, I started doing uh, science communication when I was in my uh, bachelor's, doing radio, and uh, just as a um, just as a, a context, and for the ones who might be interested in. Um, contacting or, or discussing further another time about other types of, of outreach. Um, I just wanted uh, yeah, to mention that um, I started in ra radio broadcasting, also did some Python science events in, in Cambridge, some uh, art and science uh, exhibitions. And for the ones interested in, in art and science um, and the interdisciplinary dialogue between these two disciplines, um, I will leave all the links that I, I talk about in the presentation at the end in, in, the, in the chat. So um, 
if you're interested, you can uh, reach out um, and, and find me and we can talk more about that. So about working with schools, uh, I've done science communication for schools in uh, four countries, uh, Portugal, the UK, where I did my master's, now I'm in Germany, and also briefly in, in Nigeria earlier this year. And um, yes, uh, about Nigeria, I, I wanted to mention and uh, before, I think, yeah, I think Isabel is gone, but um, is gone now, but in Nigeria, it was a, a very uh, different experience and I, I learned a lot about how to, you know, do outreach in a context that you're not used to. Um, and you talked about the churches, we did, we did outreach in, you know, in, in this kind of, of context, uh, which I was not used to. And I wrote a blog post about it, and I will leave the link later also in the chat for the ones who are more interested in, in that. So today, our focus is Cartes Conciencia and Native Scientist. Um, and these two organizations are uh, very important uh, for me and I think uh, for the community as well, uh, because I personally think that many initiatives, as Bianca mentioned in the beginning in her presentation of the, uh, the example of the library, for example, um, that uh, many initiatives are reaching audiences that are already primed for science. And I personally think that TMBL Heidelberg that I see that a lot, which is a place with a lot of money and resources and professionals hired just to do that. But still, um, we are, in my opinion, not reaching far enough. I think that we should leave no one behind uh, on the communication of science and that uh, it is our responsibility to inspire and empower generations um, to believe that science can be for them too which might, some might not um, believe, believe that. Uh, as I said, I think this is a, a very uh, moral responsibility that we have as scientists and citizens, and I've also uh, written about it, and I will leave the link um, in the chat for the ones who are more interested in the uh, more philosophy angle that science communication uh, can have in, in our responsibility. So starting with native scientists, and Joanna uh, Moscoso is here. So it's, um, um, I, it's big shoes to fill in to talk about uh, uh, native scientists in, in front of Joanna too. Native Scientist was founded by Joanna and Tatiana. Um, while they were in uh, working in London in the UK. Joanna was doing her PhD at the time. Um, and uh, it was founded with a commitment to promote diversity in science and education and in order um, so that everyone could reach their full potential uh, regardless of their background. Right, so um, it is shown that uh, migrant pupils in Europe um, achieve less in school compared to uh, non-migrant uh, pupils. And in Native Scientists, uh, we believe that uh, school performance and career prospects should not be determined by whether a child is migrant or not. And also that no child should be ashamed of speaking more than one language. And this issue of the language has been mentioned uh, before in the discussion following uh, Bianca's uh, presentation, uh, which is not only a challenge for, for children, but also sometimes for scientists who want to communicate, and I will, I will touch that a, a, bit, uh, a bit later on, and also that no child should leave school without ever uh, meeting a scientist. And uh, Native Scientist was founded in um, 2013 uh, with, these, uh, with these ideals, and um, the three main pillars of native scientists are to promote science learning, language learning, and the interaction of children with uh, role models and how with, um, so uh, native scientists has many um, different programs, but I'm going to tell you about the most popular one, which is native schools, which are one and a half hour long workshops of science in the heritage language of the migrant people. So for example, here in Heidelberg, I am uh, Portuguese. And here in Heidelberg, I've organized um, workshops with Portuguese scientists for pupils here in Heidelberg that have Portuguese as their, um, 
heritage language. Uh, the pupils are around from 6 to 12 uh, years old, and uh, we take the scientists out of the lab into the schools um, to do this kind of, you could call it speed dating with scientists too, because there, there are four scientists and um, uh, the kids, the groups of kids, we divide them in groups and they, they change. They are 15 minutes with each scientist. We prefer to call them uh, science tapas um, instead, of, uh, instead of speed dating. This is a, so these are some pictures of the workshops. Um, the scientists usually bring some, some props um, and uh, things to, to really spark the, the curiosity of, of, uh, of the pupils. Uh, um, Bianca mentioned Carolina, uh, her partner in the book, book club. She has participated here in, in, in Heidelberg, for example, to um, and Native Scientists is an award-winning organization which is in uh, seven countries and has more than 10 languages in their portfolio um, and a lot of uh, more than 5,000 uh, pupils reached in uh, 20 cities. And I, I, I really recommend that you check it out. I will also leave the links and uh, contacts in the end in the, um, in the chat. And a suggested uh, five-minute read about doing outreach in your mother tongue. We have a, a blog post, and I will also drop the, the link later, um, where we ask the, the scientists from Native Scientists what it means for them to do outreach in their mother tongue and how it impacts them from personal um, angle to professional angles and, and careers. Um, and as Joanna said, Native Scientists trains the, the scientists and the feedback is very good throughout um, every stakeholder from the pupils to the teachers to the scientists uh, who are trained. And uh, this year, um, a spin-off was uh, of Native Scientists was born, uh, Cartas Consciencia, which means literally translated to English means letters with science um, in Portuguese. Cartus Consciencia was founded by me and by my colleague, Rafael De Luca, who is a postdoc at EMBL. And uh, we have been both uh, working for Native Scientists for a while. He has been with Native Scientists for, for um, a long time. He used to organize um, Portuguese workshops in, in Paris. And uh, we founded uh, Cartus Consciencia for a world with uh, equal opportunities for all children. And our mission is to inspire uh, children in Portuguese speaking countries to consider higher education and scientific careers. And um, this came from, from the premise question of what if students and scientists exchange letters uh, during a school year? Um, and why letters, uh, you may ask. Uh, letters and physical, we're talking about physical, traditional snail mail letters, uh, they, they make this interaction a more uh, memorable and personal experience and letter writing and receiving is associated with increased feelings of uh, happiness and uh, satisfaction. And the waiting time for a real letter also creates expectation and increases the, the student involvement. But the idea to exchange letters um, was not ours. We were inspired uh, by a Letters to a Pre-Scientist, which is uh, an American program. And Rafael and I uh, volunteers for this program. And even before we were matched with a pen pal, with our background from native scientists and being so aware that we should um, reach uh, audiences and pupils which are not being um, reached, we thought that we needed to do um, a similar initiative uh, for the for the Portuguese speaking countries. So, so yeah, so um, uh, Portuguese is spoken by more than 250 million people around the world. And there are nine uh, countries that have Portuguese as a, an official uh, language in uh, four continents. And um, at Cartus Consciencia, we have four central axes, which are science, education, language, and uh, society. So um, um, why do these um, 
in Portuguese speaking countries, it has been shown that students with less qualified parents or with lower socioeconomic status are less likely to enter, to enter higher education. And um, the realities in the nine different countries are, are very varied, as you can see here uh, by this graph. And we want, we have, we also have, if you look at the World Bank uh, status of each country, you see how how it is um, very varied and also that um, we, we have five, five of these nine countries are uh, listed in the least developed countries um, in, in the world uh, by, by the UN. And we want to promote uh, scientific and linguistic literacy as well as the educational and professional aspirations of students. This is the education side. On the language side, we want to promote Portuguese as a language of knowledge and access to opportunities and cooperation amongst uh, different countries. Uh, Portuguese is not the mother tongue um, in all the countries where it's uh, official uh, Portuguese uh, speaking. And, and in fact, in some countries, um, it's, uh, it is the official language, but uh, the, the proficiency is, is not that good, but it is the language um, that will give people access to the official institutions, to higher education. So it is indeed um, um, an access to, to further opportunities. We also we want to offer experience in science communication to scientists and uh, provide them with opportunity for a more meaningful interactions with society and here you have some some stats from the the welcome trust um uh survey um that says that most scientists still um uh, consider that they have a moral responsibility to do outreach but they would interact more actually if they have more opportunities and, and more training and some of them uh don't feel prepared to do it actually so on the 5th of may of 2020 this year which was uh, the first world portuguese language day we launched uh Partes Consciencia, and uh we have um so far um, a network of 700 scientists, 500, 400 of those who completed the training, we trained them as well. Bianca, Bianca did, did the training uh, with us. We also have a network of uh, 25 teachers and um, we want to improve the way societies view education, science and diversity through our communication channels which uh, I invite you all to, to follow. We do content both in, in Portuguese and in English as well. So now we have uh, four classes ongoing with letter exchanges already, one in Portugal, one in São Tomé and Príncipe, and one in Timor-Leste. Uh, actually two in Portugal and one in each of the, um, of the other countries. Here are some pictures of the, of the pupils in São Tomé and Príncipe um, writing their, their letters, and they're actually not in, um, in their usual Portuguese class or science class like we have in other classes here. They are actually from a group of um, extracurricular group, which is the laboratory for writing, and uh, then it was the perfect, um, uh, perfect setting to to explore the, the letter writing for, for scientists. Here are pictures of some students in East Timor, Timor-Leste, also uh, preparing, preparing their letters. And we hope that in three years, we can uh, be exchanging letters, or our scientists can be exchanging letters with all the, the nine uh, Portuguese-speaking countries, and then future expand to other um, Portuguese-speaking communities as well. So these two organizations, one which is a spin-off of another, Native Scientists is our incubator from, from Partes Consciencia. So one is focused at Portuguese, is aimed at Portuguese speaking pupils in four continents. Native Scientists is focused on migrant pupils for now um, in, Europe, in Europe, but in more than uh, 10 uh, languages so far. And um, in Cartos, our method is uh, letter exchanges during a school year. And the Native Scientist, the most popular uh, program, is this one-time uh, science tapas workshop, which are moving 
online this year with the pandemic. And as, as I, I told uh, Carmen before, um, Ud Native is trying different formats than to learn what, what is the best and most effective way to, to be able to, to deal with unforeseen uh, circumstances like this. Um, a common axis of these two programs and before, um, so Bianca, you were saying that uh, to invite speakers, for example, for kind of scientists, first you go on the topics and then you go on the speakers. Actually, um, um, a feature of native scientists that we also have in Partish Consciences is that our programs are, are people-centered and not content-centered. Um, so um, we are really centered on the interaction of the role models uh, with the pupils um, and accept scientists from all areas of research, not uh, just STEM. And, and this is to educate and inspire the next generation of citizens who might potentially uh, be, be scientists and bust stereotypes, show them how science works, show them that science has a lot of global and diverse dimensions and not not just to, it's not to influence just future scientists, but to citizens who will be curious, well-educated, and also critical consumers of information, which is uh, so, so relevant um, nowadays uh, more than ever. Bianca, you mentioned uh, very well already, so I wanted to raise the point that it is very important to evaluate what we do and measure impact. Um, in order in order to learn and, and to do better. Um, at Cartos, we, we collect both quantitative and qualitative uh, data for, for our impact measurement. Native scientists uh, um, also, also does the same. Um, and uh, both organizations partner with researchers um, on science education um, to, to be able to do uh, impact research that is the best uh, quality we can. Uh, Native is partnering with the University of Tübingen. We are partnering with the University of Aveiro in Portugal, um, uh, both researchers in science education or education of, scientists, of sciences, uh, it depends. And uh, hopefully by increasing access to uh, higher education in science, we are uh, promoting the, the reduction of inequalities. And that's the, the longer, uh, bigger picture aim here. Uh, how you can engage with us. So you can, uh, since BioRoom is uh, Twitter focused, you can see here, with the arrow, the, the Twitter handle of Native Scientists. I will drop the, the link for the website below. And also you have my, my email here also if you want to, to reach out. Um, at Partos Consciencia as well, I will drop the link of the website. There are many ways to support us even if you don't speak uh, Portuguese. So do, do, check, do check our website out and follow us in our social media and our website is also uh, available in English. Um, and I would like to, to thank uh, Bianca, Byron, Joana and Native Scientists also, uh, not just for the amazing work and the opportunity to, to, to contribute to Native Scientists, but also for, for the Native Scientists slides and, and resources and um, everyone uh, involved uh, with Cartos, Rafael who founded Cartos with me and Romana who is our uh, new uh, team member. And uh, I would like to end with a quote uh, that Joanna used in recently this weekend in the Native Scientist Annual Meeting that we have, that entrepreneurship happens when individuals decide not to ignore their passion and ideas. And I hope this inspires you and you can reach out whenever if you, if you feel like it. And I will, I will drop the, the links now in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Mariana, for sharing with us the story of these two wonderful initiatives. I have mm -hmm. to say, as you mentioned, that I completed this um, Cartes Consciencia um, training and how, how nice and important it was for me as a participant in this 
to, to get this training, the fact that you had a, such a well thought training for the for the scientists participating already um, gave another some satisfaction and I already learned so much just by doing this. It's such a valuable thing. So thank you for that. Um, this is really important step. It would have been a, a very different experience, of course, if you know, someone just asks you to do this and participate as a scientist and um, doesn't put the effort in to, to prepare you and give you this training. Um, so this speaks to the quality of your work. I was also thinking um, during your talk that um, unfortunately it would be quite difficult for me to speak in my native language about the research that I'm currently doing. So that's something for me to reflect on and improve on. And I have a first question. What would you say is the most challenging thing to, to teach the scientists or, or for the scientists themselves when they interact with the children in these workshops? What's the most delicate or, or, or challenging um, aspect of scientists coming to, to talk to children? We already talked a bit with Joanna about this, how um, it's a tough, it could be a, a tough crowd and it's quite the test for your science communication skills when the public is um, just children. Uh, I think at Native Scientists, it really helps that every um every workshop is um is organized by a coordinator a local coordinator who who usually has uh, participated in in workshops before and 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 actually has um some tips for you i, I speak from from uh, personal experience for me when i participated in in the native scientist workshop obviously with kids uh, it's always tough if they if they are not being responsive. But if you have someone who is you know if the coordinator then has organized other workshops or in the in the webinar and the training that we get at, at Native Scientists that that you always get before before doing the workshop, um, you learn that you know not every kid will be super interested. It's just you know that that's just normal that it can happen that a kid looks uh, more bored. For some people, uh, it's about uh, where to find resources, you know, like, okay, my area of science, uh, I don't really know how to do something hands-on or interactive. So then sometimes that's the, that's the challenge that uh, you can look for uh, resources of, of how to make it more, more interactive. And um, yeah, I think I think that's that's the main the main challenge. It also happens in some classes that uh, the kids are are not so proficient in their in their mother tongue actually. So that's that that can be a challenge, special if you're um, if for in my in my case I don't speak German that well. So then it's challenging for me if if I'm doing the, the Portuguese workshop in in Germany. But usually the teachers help or other kids who are more proficient in their mother tongue. Um, or heritage language, um, they can help too. And uh, and what matters is that they, you know, they come home and even if they just learned a new word in their heritage language, that's um, um, that's already worth it. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I think many of us here know what it means to speak uh, in your daily life to three different languages and how it ends up being that each of the languages has a very limited vocabulary that is being used actively for certain specific topics and then you start losing or finding your words with more difficulty when you suddenly want to talk about science in your native language or the other way around. Any questions related to this? Anyone else wants to share with us their um, issues when speaking to languages every day? I can totally relate and you know I did my PhD in, in, in Spain in Spanish and later I came to the US to the US to start my postdoc so I had to switch totally to English practically and at the beginning for me it was super hard because I didn't even know how to say beaker or how to say gravity cylinder in English but now I find myself in a totally opposite place it's like I'm not able sometimes to communicate in Spanish that well my science and for me that is a problem because for instance here in the states we have a very uh, a, a considerable percentage of um, Hispanic population and that's also um, something that it's important because we have to believe especially in this country that for doing science you need to have good English and you need to speak good English and English is the language of science but actually science is a way of thinking is how how you're 
how your 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 thoughts are going and what you're doing. So starting here, some initiatives to try to bring science to students, to 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 scholars, like in high school, middle school, that are um, Spanish speakers as first language, and they had struggled with the English, and. I don't know how it is going to be because I really find myself doubting on how to pronounce or know how to pronounce, how to find the words in Spanish to make them believe that they can do science. I mean, they can think in Spanish and still be good scientists. And I don't know how I'm going to do it if I cannot even do it myself right now. <laughs> so that is a real challenge for me right now. Yes, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah, if you do not train it and um, do not practice it, at some point it becomes difficult. Yes. It does, and and but I do agree that um, it's super important to keep doing science in your own language somehow, because a language that is not used for one sphere of the of life, like science or anything, it's a uh, you're killing your language little by little. You know, you're not making it suitable for these purposes. So it's becoming like you're really relegating your language only for like home and doing that kind of things, and you are making it like having less prestige. So I really believe. So these kind of initiatives are awesome and uh, I I cannot do any other thing but clapping super loud because I love what you are doing and um, and I really admire you because it's amazing what you're doing. Thank you very much for all the all the community that, that has this chance to grow thanks to, to you. I, I yes. would like to sort of express my absolute admiration. This was fantastic. I learned so much uh, and uh, I would like to invite you all to come on the 8th of December when I'm talking about the social construction, especially you, Mariana, as a philosopher, talk about the social construction of science, um, because that sort of totally interweaves with what you're doing. I would love to have some input from you all on that and have a group discussion, um, because it also so it then affects how we teach the next generation and uh, what knowledge gets passed on and what gets just talked about, what's part of our narrative and stories. And that's often not so much shed light on when we are both educated as a scientist and then as, as we do the outreach. So um, I, I invite you all to come on the 8th um, and I very much look forward to that. Um, it would you know, you have such a big fund of knowledge here and uh, I'm looking forward to, to that uh, group discussion then. So thank you all very much for fantastic presentation. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Mariana. And also thank you, Joanna, for um, joining us today and for your input. Yes, so I think Carmen left and she made me the co-host of the other Carmen. I think it's going to wrap up the session. And um, I would like to thank Bianca for organizing this amazing thing, for Mariana, for Mariana for being here, also for Joanna for being here today. I think it has been an amazing experience. And now I, it's, it's happened to me like the same thing with the blogs. Now I have so much idea of what I can do. So you're really contributing to do science better around the world. So thank you very much for this and a big clap. And so I hope to see you here next week, same time, 9.30 in the United States. <laughs> I think it's going to be 3.30 in Europe, right? 3.30 on the <laughs> Germany time zone, yes. Exactly. And um, so, yeah, and the rest you calculate. I don't know. <laughs> it's very hard. <laughs> but thank you very much for being here. And now I admire even more Carmen for doing this because I'm a disaster, but she does it great. And so it's like so easy and flow and, and everything. So thank you very much for being here. And I hope to see you around and, and, and keep working to make uh, science accessible for everyone. So... Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.